Hello and welcome to Church Online. My name is Al and I'm one of the associate ministers here at St Andrews. It's really great to have you with us. Today we're starting a new sermon series in the Lord's Prayer where we're going to be drilling down deep into this rich piece of scripture. We're looking forward to that, but for many of us, being back online will be a bit of an anticlimax. And Alex, what are, what are some of the challenges that we're facing at the moment? Uh, yeah, thanks Al. Hi everyone. Thanks for joining us today online. It's been a, a pretty difficult year between protests and pandemic, the economic downturn, uh, homeschooling and now travel restrictions. Uh, we, we did think that a lot of this was out of the way and maybe there was a light at the end of the tunnel. But now it seems with these new restrictions, that light is a little bit further away. So there is a sense of frustration, maybe an anticlimax. Um, and what the future will bring. Uh, added into all of this is the national security law, concerns about its implementation, when will we be able to travel again, when will COVID go away. So there's this deep sense of uncertainty, probably a lot of frustration, uh, let alone uh, material difficulties that a lot of people are facing. Loads of difficulties. That's not to say that the last few months haven't been worth their, with their, without their encouragements as well. I've been really encouraged, super encouraged by lots of people signing online for church. Our growth groups have kept on meeting. Some of those growth groups have reported record attendance. Mm. Some of them have had really good sharing and there's been the sense of God's work continuing and God's people persevering. But that's not to say that there aren't challenges and in face of some of those challenges, in the face of some of those challenges, what are some of the things that you'd encourage us to keep doing? Yeah, it's a good question because um, we don't know often what to do when the course is uncertain. We've just finished a series in Paul's uh, first letter to the Thessalonians. He's speaking to this young church under a lot of pressure, a lot of persecution, and he speaks about these Christian characteristics, faith, hope, and love, which are the product of a, a supernaturally changed heart. Uh, these characteristics can help us a lot in this time. Faith is this perseverance, this fixedness, this determination to keep your spiritual habits, Bible reading, prayer, and, and all those types of things which make your spiritual life healthy, which, which are for your good. Um, hope is not looking at your circumstances for your sense of joy and peace, but fixing your desires somewhere else. And we know that the Christian hope is unique. It's based on Jesus' death and resurrection and the promise of his return. And it gives us this sense of confidence and calmness despite all the difficult circumstances. And so we resolve to be people of hope, even though currently in Hong Kong, it feels difficult sometimes to, to have hope. And, and lastly, love. Uh, Christians are people who are supposed to be other person centered uh, and we're called together in a community to support one another. Sometimes uh, during these restrictions we go into siege mentality, survival mode, um, we isolate ourselves but as we've been saying a lot, social distancing doesn't mean social, social isolation. So we want to connect with one another, we want to um, help one another out and practically speaking that just might mean taking the initiative to call people, meet with people, ask people how they're going. Uh, maybe reach out yourself if you need help. Thanks so much, Alex. We're gonna hand over now to our music team who are gonna lead us in a song.
Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 15. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Prayer can be difficult. The last two men alive in a World War I trench were an officer and a private. 
The enemy was descending upon them. There was no way of escape. And so the officer says to the private, Jones, there's only one thing you should do, pray. But Jones replies, sir, I I don't know how to pray. I only know one prayer. The officer said, I'm not going to tell you again. Do it now. Pray. All right, sir. And so Private Jones clasps his hands together and closes his eyes and prays, Lord, for what we are about to receive, make us truly thankful. Uh, Prayer can be difficult. Uh, It's not just for the Private Joneses. It's difficult for many Christians. Uh, We're too busy, too stressed, too distracted. We've got so much going on in our minds. Often we're reluctant to pray. We, We struggle with apathy. Prayer can be difficult for many people. And yet, if you're a Christian, there is nothing more essential than to pray. Robert Murray McShane once said, when someone is alone on their knees before God, that they are and that alone. In other words, uh, there is nothing more vital than who we are to who we are and and what we do than prayer. Now, prayer is important for at least three reasons. First, you cannot know God except through prayer. Uh, For any relationship to exist, communication is vital. Uh, There's a difference between knowing about God and actually knowing God. There's, there's a difference between knowing something about God and knowing him in a deep and personal way. Prayer is communication. It's the, the way we enjoy intimacy with God. But secondly, you cannot know yourself except through prayer. If we are creatures made by God, then the way we know ourselves is to be connected to that God, to know his mind, his purposes, his priorities for us. Uh, To understand God, in many respects, is to understand yourself. If you're disconnected from your creator, then there is only a limited amount that you can know about yourself. It's only through prayer that you can get a real sense of who you are. And thirdly, you cannot know real peace except through prayer. Our world conditions us to expect comfort and security and, and perfect fulfillment and Materially speaking, we've we've never had it so good. And yet we live in this age of anxiety. All around us, people are anxious, uncertain, fearful, dissatisfied. And yet the Bible tells us, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything pray. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts Maybe you've felt that deep sense of perspective and calm when you've just spent even 10 minutes in focused prayer, more so than getting calm from Netflix or shopping or hours in a restaurant. Prayer is the most important thing we can do to know God, to know yourself, to have peace. So if it's the key for everything, how do we do it? Well, the Lord's Prayer is Jesus' way of answering this for his disciples. It's a masterclass in prayer from the Lord of Prayer. Jesus himself was familiar with the realities of life. He knew what it was to be tired, to be disappointed, to be burdened down by the responsibilities of life. But he also knew how incredibly valuable prayer was. The Gospels speak repeatedly about how Jesus prayed. He prayed in public. He prayed alone over and over and over again. And the Lord's Prayer is probably the set of words that has been most repeated in human history. Almost certainly there is no set of words that has been more frequently repeated by people. And it's beautifully simplistic and spiritually stunning because here compressed and summarized is the breadth of Scripture There, you can go amplifying these particular phrases and capturing what the Bible teaches about God's priorities and his purposes for humanity, meditating on different parts of the Bible and on different parts of life. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to be thinking about the Lord's Prayer by looking at each of these phrases, beginning today with that first phrase, 
our Father in heaven. And so we'll see two things, the basis of prayer and the manner of prayer. Jesus begins by teaching us the basis of prayer. The first thing we need to know is that we pray to our Father in heaven. Now, the original word that Jesus uses here for Father is the Aramaic word Abba. It's a term of respectful intimacy used in Jewish families. It's more respectful than daddy, but it's more intimate than father. It's like dad. And Jesus tells us to begin our prayers by addressing the, the transcendent creator, the omniscient ruler, the terrifying judge of the universe as dad. Straight away here from the very beginning, we, we get something intensely powerful and reassuring. Before we say anything, we remind ourselves about the one to whom we are speaking. We are addressing the God of the universe as, as dad, as our father. Now, of any relationship that you have, the father-child relationship is the most unconditional it's even more unconditional than the relationship between a husband and a wife. Uh, if a five-year-old daughter wakes up her father at three o'clock in the morning and says to him, Daddy, could you get me a drink of water? What's the dad going to do? Well, he's going to go up and get his five-year-old daughter that drink. But if his wife tries the same thing, she elbows him and says at three o'clock in the morning, hey, can you get me a drink of water? What's he going to say? Well, he's probably going to say, sweetie, can't you get it yourself? The father-child relationship is the most unconditional of relationships. There's nothing that the child can do to earn a place in that relationship. The child doesn't sit in interview. They don't pass a series of tests. It's not based on performance. It's the most unconditional of relationships to have free access. And that's what we have with God. When we say father, we remind ourselves of the relationship that we have to the God of the universe, we have free access. I remember the story about a Yankee soldier during the American Civil War. He tried to get leave from his company so that he could visit his parents who were dying. But that permission wasn't forthcoming from his superiors. And so he happened to be in the Washington area and thought, maybe if I go directly to the top, directly to the White House, I can get that permission. But understandably, and not surprisingly, it, it was impossible for him to see the president. So he leaves despondently and goes off to a nearby park and, and weeps bitterly. A boy happens to walk by and, and asks him, why is he crying? And the man tells the boy this story. After a while, the boy says, come, follow me. They leave the park, walk back towards the White House, go through the gate, through the front door, up the stairs, down through some corridors and straight into the presidential office. Abraham looks up from his desk and says, what can I do for you, Tad? And Tad replies, father, there's a man here who would like to speak with you. You know, that's exactly the type of access that you and I have to the, to the God of the universe. Lots of people pray. Prayer is common amongst the world religions. Even those people who wouldn't ordinarily call themselves spiritual or religious would on occasions pray when hard pressed. But here Jesus invites us into a relationship. He invites us into a relationship with his father as our father. And the New Testament repeatedly says that we only have access to God through Jesus Christ. And so Romans 5 verse 1 tells us, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Now, ordinarily, you and I cannot have access to God. Uh, I cannot have access on my own with God because of all the ways in which I try to push God to the sidelines of my life, uh, that I reject him, disobey him. I'm constantly putting my own priorities, my own agenda ahead of him. You know, if God 
sees and knows everything, then that means nothing is hidden from his sight. If there was a documentary made about my life where everything I said, everything I did was recorded 24 seven, then nothing would be hidden. Not, not even those things I thought no one else would know. Those things God would see. And you know, I don't even live consistently by my own standards, let alone God's standards. So how can I, how can I stand in the holy and pure presence of God? How can I have access to him? You know, there was one time when Jesus prayed amongst all the other times he prayed where he didn't address God as father on the cross. He didn't cry out to God as father. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What was happening? Well, on the cross, Jesus was losing access to the father. He was thrown out of the family, so to speak. He was rejected by his eternal and heavenly father so that one day we wouldn't have to be. He was taking everything upon himself that we deserved. Now, when you, when you come to believe in Jesus and you make him your Lord and savior, Jesus, the eternal son of God, gives you access, the same access to the father that he has. It's like he's saying, Father, there is someone here who would like to speak with you. But it's even more than that. When you come into a relationship with Jesus, you are adopted by God as your father, given all the privileges of membership in his family. A, a home, a, ha a room prepared for you in his house, an eternal inheritance, wonderful intimacy. This heavenly father knows you completely and loves you unconditionally. Now, being able to pray to God, having access to him doesn't come simply because we've mastered some technique. It doesn't come because we've walked along some mystical path of enlightenment. It's not because we've earned it. Like we climb the promotion ladder at work and you do all the hard things and finally you get into the room where all the decisions are made, where all the important people are, the CEO. No, you haven't earned it. Jesus invites you in. But it cuts the other way, doesn't it? You know, sometimes we're reluctant to pray because our heart says, I don't feel like a child of God. I don't, I don't feel like I belong. I deserve it. I, I, I don't act like I'm a child of God. I deserve to be thrown out. And so we don't pray. Remind yourself, begin your prayers as Jesus begins by, by saying our Father. Drill it in that you are loved unconditionally by your heavenly Father. So Jesus teaches us about the basis of prayer, but secondly, he teaches us about the manner of prayer. If we pray to God, who's our father in heaven, then it transforms how we pray. It radically affects our motives. Now, you may have noticed in this passage, which is from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, that, that he talks about two wrong motives as we pray. The first wrong motive is a, is a mistake that religious people make. It, it's to pray to the wrong audience. And so in verse five, Jesus says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Now, in Jesus' days, prayer would be led by a man standing in the front of the synagogue. And this practice could easily descend into a performance. And often during religious festivals, a trumpet would sound from the temple. And it was common for people to stop what they were doing and go towards the temple in order to pray. But it was also common for Pharisees to stop what they were doing and stand on the street corners and pray towards the temple so that everyone could see. It was a display of self-conscious piety to gain the attention and admiration of the people around them. Now, you and I live in different times, but our hearts are no different. You know, when we pray with others around us, often our prayer can become a performance. 
we search for the eloquent words, we look for the right turn of phrase, we reach for the profound idea, the insight, the, the covert teaching, it all of a sudden becomes about us. We, we pray for our own benefit, to send a message to others or to win their quiet admiration. But Jesus says, your eyes are wrong, the wrong audience. And so he tells us in verse six, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. We often do things to be seen by others, but Jesus tells us ultimately you are seen by God. If God really is our loving heavenly father, then everything we think or say or do is under his loving and watching gaze. Everything comes to his attention and mind. That means regardless of whoever is around you, you live before the audience of one. You live before God. And so why then would you be so fixated upon what other people around you think? Why would you be so besotted about getting their approval? Why would you be so concerned about the subjects of the kingdom when you have the audience of the king? Now think about how this reality should affect your life. If you pray to God as your father, that means you're an heir, you're being promised an eternal inheritance. That means that, you know, really it doesn't, matter what people think about you. It doesn't matter really what the boss thinks about you. It doesn't matter if someone tries to take down your reputation. In the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really even matter if you, you get a chronic illness. Let me put it this way. If, if you have a billion dollars in the bank and someone picks your pocket of $100, do you get stressed out? No, of course you shouldn't. And yet some of us do. When somebody criticizes you or tries to bring you down, you, you, you melt away. Uh, we, we become obsessed with climbing up the ladder of public opinion with, with those around us. We become enamored and constantly worried by what people think about you. And in other words, you're looking to the wrong audience. You've forgotten that you're a child of God, that you've got an audience with the king. If the first mistake is to pray to the wrong audience, the second mistake is, is to pray forgetting that God loves you. And so verse seven, and when you pray, do not keep babbling like the pagans for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Often when people pray, they try to bend God's ear. We try to force God to listen. We somehow think that the length of our argument will convince God to answer our prayers. And it's a common habit. Think of the people around the world praying on their mats, the different religions who observe that practice or, or people who go back and forth praying at a wailing wall or spinning a prayer wheel or burning incense or those who, who make their appeals to saints who finger these special beads or light candles. These are all rituals, all practices and ceremonies, special words, maybe with good intention, but with the background assumption about God, that God might be too shallow enough that I can actually manipulate him with my words, that God is not wise enough that he needs my advice, that God is not caring enough that I must overcome his reluctance to listen to me by persisting in prayer. But it's like Jesus saying, don't be like those people. Don't think that you can nag God into getting what you want. Don't think you have to fill God in about every situation like he doesn't know. You have a father in heaven who knows exactly what you need before you do. You have a father in heaven who is more committed to your good than you are. 
Now, of course, Jesus isn't saying that we should only pray for short periods. He'll say elsewhere in the Gospels to his disciples that we should persist in prayer. The Apostle Paul says we should be constantly praying. But the background assumption is that sometimes we can be forgetful in prayer. Uh, we, when we extract what we want from God in prayer, we forget that God is always working for our good, that he loves us. Look, when we pray our Father, we're also saying, Father, I know that you're listening to me all the time. I know that you're going to answer my prayer even when I can't quite see what that answer is. If you're a parent, you know this, your heart aches to provide for the good of your child. If your child asks for something and you can't give them what they need and they begin to cry, it feels like something within you is dying and you, you won't rest until you try to figure out how you can provide what your child needs. Why would it therefore be any different with God? Would God not be able to give us what is for our good, what we need? And so when we, when we pray our Father, we pray with total confidence, knowing that God is our Father, we are his children, and he will provide for our good according to his purposes, and, 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 and even though you don't know exactly how he'll answer his, your prayers. Now, what does this look like in practice? Rebecca was late one morning on her way to work. Uh, it takes her at least 40 minutes on the bus to get to Admiralty, and she was a bit stressed out because she couldn't get a seat on the bus and she had to stand, and she'd forgotten her phone at home. And so she couldn't exactly do what she normally does. She couldn't check her email. She couldn't check TikTok. And so as she's standing there in the bus holding on to the handrail, she begins to pray, praying that prayer, the Lord's Prayer that she'd taught, been taught only a few years ago when she'd become a Christian. And as she begins to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, she pauses, thinking about every single word. She, she says, dear heavenly dad, thank you that you love me. Thank you that I can call you my father. Thank you that you sent Jesus to me and that through him I'm adopted into your family. Thank you that you've promised me an eternal home. And thank you that you listen to me, even though I'm not very faithful or constant in prayer. And Lord, I pray for my community at church. Thank you that we're a family. I pray for the people in my group. I pray for Cindy, whose mum has cancer. And I pray that today at work, you might help me to do my job well, that, that I can honour you and help me to persevere with Gavin because he's giving me a hard time and, and help me to be able to, to share Jesus with Wendy because she seems interested. Then after 25 minutes or so, Re Rebecca got distracted. Someone jostled into her and she, she stopped praying. But she looked at her watch and she thought to herself, that, that felt good. And it wasn't so hard. I'll do that again. Maybe I'll do that every morning. We can pray constantly, joyfully, eagerly, confidently, all because we have a Father in heaven who delights to listen to us and who loves us. Let's pray. Our Father. Thank you that you give us this incredible gift of prayer, that you delight to listen to us and that we can call you our Father because of what your Son Jesus has done for us on the cross. Lord, thank you that we're adopted into your family, that we have the full rights and privileges of membership, that we have a heavenly home prepared for us and that you constantly provide for our good. Forgive our reluctance to pray, how we constantly get besotted, distracted by the demands of this world, and we forget this incredible resource, this gift that you've given us. Lord, help us to be people marked with prayer in every season. Guide us by your spirit, Lord, because we need your help, we pray. Amen. Hi, church. For those of you who haven't met me yet, my name is Suzanne, and I'm relatively new here at St. Andrews. For those of you um, 
who know, we are back to more stringent requirements, and so we're back to worship online, and small groups will be meeting online, because we do want to serve you and protect your health and safety. But it's most important at this time for us to spend our time in prayer and looking to the Lord for our strength and our guidance. Today's uh, verse is from the book of Lamentations, chapter 3. For those of you who know Jeremiah, he was called the weeping prophet because Jeremiah suffered so much for speaking the truth. And yet in the midst of his lamentations, uh, he, we find in chapter 3 this verse. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those who hope in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Let us pray. First, in our prayers for the world, we lift up Thailand. O oh Lord, give them your peace and your stability in spite of political turmoil and unrest. We stand with those who fight against the corruption and oppression of drug and sex trafficking. Let the light of the gospel spread in this predominantly Buddhist country. We pray that you would strengthen the small but vibrant Thai church that it might be a faithful witness to Christ. Help the NGOs and charities working in Thailand, many of which are Christian, to use their resources well to share the love of Christ. And please, Lord, protect the refugees and asylum seekers across the world, especially those fleeing war-torn countries or religious persecution. Protect them, O oh Lord, and provide food, shelter, and security. Give wisdom to world leaders as they seek long-term solutions for millions of displaced people. Next, we intercede for Hong Kong with the recent escalation of COVID-19 infections and increased restrictions. We ask for the recovery of the afflicted and extra protection and safety for frontline workers and caregivers. Please help us, O oh Lord, to deal with our frustrations and anxieties in these difficult times so that we would persevere and be patient as much as possible. For those who have been deeply affected by the slowdown in the economy, provide for their material and financial needs. We pray especially for the poor, the homeless, and the marginalized. Open our eyes to see them and to care for them as Jesus would want us to. And Lord, help all the Christians across the city to be united in our faith, despite other differences that we may have, so that we would be a source of hope and encouragement to others because of what we have in Christ. Finally, we pray for St. Andrews, that we would be a community of mutual support and love for one another. Even though we come from a wide variety of backgrounds, we have a deep common bond in you in these difficult times, we need to stay connected to one another, providing love and care and pointing one another to Jesus. We are grateful for Arlene and our Home for You ministry, which cares for our domestic worker community with joy and faithfulness. Please continue to give them opportunities to learn from God's word and to grow in their love for Jesus. Provide for their spiritual and emotional needs as they serve in Hong Kong and are far away from their families. For all of us, in these times of increased social distancing and bans on group meetings, teach us how to draw closer to you, God. May we be eager to practice our spiritual disciplines of prayer and Bible reading and be quick to look on what you are teaching us. During these times of trial and anxiety, we take comfort in knowing that you are enough. Your compassions never fail, and you are always faithful. O oh Lord, we put our hope in you and wait for you. Amen. A couple of notices from me as we finish. 
firstly, our ACM. Now, our ACM is scheduled to take place next week. Obviously, the new restrictions put quite severe limitations on that. It means that not many people can be there physically. We're going to press ahead with it because we've already rescheduled it once, and if we keep on postponing it, that's not going to be helpful. We'd still love you to take part online. You can find details on our website. Just check that out. The other thing to mention is giving. During this time, we're hugely dependent on the generosity of people. If you'd like to give towards God's work here at St. Andrews, then we'd appreciate that. Again, you can find all of the details online. That's all for now. Thank you so much for joining us. See you next week.